Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Welcome everyone, welcome to the Commonwealth Club. And uh, Shannon, thank you for joining us on the coldest day in San Francisco <laughs> history, so. I feel like I'm in New York, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, it's great to be with everyone at the, the, this lovely facility in downtown San Francisco. Um, I'm Lenny Mendoza, uh, Senior Partner Emeritus at McKinsey and a member of Council on Foreign Relations and on the Board of Governors for the Commonwealth Club. And it's my pleasure to be joined today by Shannon K. O'Neill. Dr. O'Neill is the Nelson and David Rockefeller Senior Fellow for Latin American Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. She's here to discuss her new book, The Globalization Myth, Why Regions Matter. And in it, she argues that regionalization, not globalization, has been the biggest economic force for the last 40 years and calls on the United States to embrace deepening regional ties to succeed in an increasingly connected and competitive world. So, Shian, again, welcome to San Francisco. Great, thanks so much. <laughs> well, let's start with, um, and before we get, just one more reminder if, about questions, that I will be talking with Dr. O'Neill for half an hour, 40 minutes or so, but if you're in person and you have questions, there's question cards on your seat, so please feel free to write them and they'll come up to me, and if you're online, use the text chat on YouTube and we'll get those as well. So with that, why don't we start a little bit with, um, why did you decide to write this book? What prompted you to think about globalization and real regionalization? Yeah, so it came out, I was actually doing a project for the Council on Foreign Relations where I work, and I was doing a project on North America and looking at the integration of the US, Canada, and Mexico. And in that, the, the task force I was working on, so this project, this group that came together, we looked at all kinds of issues. We looked at energy, we looked at security, we looked at people, and then we looked at commerce and, and economic ties. And when I was doing that, I was going out and interviewing CEOs and other people in business and looking at, at what industries and companies crossed the borders and, and how they did it and what the issues were. And you know, as I was working on this, I got really fascinated by this sort of lattice work of suppliers and buyers and customers that, that cross the border. And you know, what we today call, you know, we talk a lot about supply chains, but at the time it wasn't really a familiar term. People weren't really talking about it. And so I started looking into that sort of economic ties and commercial ties in North America. And you know, the idea of this report was sort of, look how tied we are to each other. But when I was doing that, I started looking at global data and, and looking more broadly. And you know, I found that, sure, North America was tied to each other. About 40% of the trade that happens, happens between these three countries, you know, US, Mexico, and Canada. But that actually other parts of the world, and particularly Europe and Asia, are more integrated. They trade about 60, 65% with each other. And so I really just was interested in this, does it matter? And is this maybe what explains a little bit, or what does it explain? And maybe it explains a little bit um, some of the economic competitiveness we see out of Asia, or we see out of Europe, and some of the challenges that, that US communities face. Okay, and, and why did you decide to title it globalization myth? What, what is it about globalization that is a myth? So, there's sort of two, as I looked into all this data and started interviewing people, I think there's two big myths that we have out there. And you know, if you open the newspaper, you turn on the news, people talk about globalization a lot, right? And people, you know, you love it or you hate it, but there's this idea that it is widespread and all penetrating and it's upended our world. And, and you know, the last 30, 40 years has been just hyper globalization. And when I started delving into the data behind it, that's not actually true. Um, and over the last 40 years, there have only been about two dozen countries that you can really say their economies were transformed by globalization, where they saw trade as part of their GDP, as part of their economy, double or more. And there are dozens more, there's 89 countries to be precise, that saw trade as a percentage of GDP, of their overall economy, stay the same, or even decline. So there's a good number of countries that have deglobalized over these last 40 years. So one of the myths is that everybody's been affected. And, and I think that's not true, right? There's only about 25 countries that have really been affected by that. So that's one part. 
And then the other myth is that when companies went abroad, when trade started happening, that they went and searched on the other side of the world, that they went totally global. And we definitely have examples of companies that are global, right? Boeing sources from 58, 57, 58 different countries. You can find other examples, but alongside the big high profile Boeings or Coca-Colas and the like, you have thousands, probably tens of thousands of companies that, yes, they did go international, they find suppliers abroad or they find customers abroad, but they didn't go so far away. They went much nearby. And I think one telling statistic here is that the average good that is traded travels 3,000 miles. And that is about the distance between New York and Los Angeles, um, or San Francisco. Um, it does not get you to Shenzhen or Shanghai or Berlin or, or lots of other places from, you know, as you think about it. So when you combine those two, you have not that many countries actually participated in globalization. And those that did really internationalize but didn't necessarily globalize, and what you've seen over these last 40 years is the rise of three big producing regions, manufacturing regions, a European one, an Asian one, and a North American one. Um, and today, 90% of all trade comes out of those three blocks. The rest of the world, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, South Asia, they only produce 10% of goods that are traded around the world. So they've really been left on the margins of you know, this concept that we think of, of globalization. Hmm. So when you contrast that with regionalization, define what you mean by regionalization for us and, and why is that the defining characteristic of how you see activity actually occurring? What, what's behind this? So there's a lot of reasons why we often turn to our neighbors rather than go to the other side of the world. You know, we all know from the last couple of years, you can Zoom with anybody. You can Zoom with somebody in a different time zone on the other side of the world, but it's not particularly easy, right? You try to match up your schedules and the like. Um, you might have differences in languages. If you're doing working in a business, you might have differences in legal systems or accounting or, or customs or just basic understanding. It's, you know, even with low cost transportation and logistics and the like, it's still, when you're manufacturing something, you're providing services, you're building teams, and teams are hard when people are, have physical distance or have a conceptual distance, you know, national distances and the like. So part of it is, is that. Another reason why I think regions tend to, to sort of come together, you sort of turn to those next door to you, um, has to do with rules, with free trade agreements, with other kinds of ties that governments have put in place. And you know, this is particularly, I would say, the case for the integration or regionalization we've seen in Europe. You know, Europe, since, the, since World War II, has just introduced treaty after treaty after treaty to bring those economies together. So there's lots of rules that first took away tariffs, and then took away regulations, and then brought together one currency, and then brought together one passport, and invested in countries. So through all of those rules, they brought countries together. And so you really see who's on the inside and who's on the outside. And, you know, Brexit tells you who's on the outside now and, and the cost to that. Um, but, there's, but the reasons, I think, also are just more mundane reasons um, when you when you might think to go abroad, um, and there's reasons to go abroad. Um, you know, there's an interesting survey by McKinsey, you know, global consulting firm, um, and they surveyed about 600 companies, and they found that when companies internationalize, when they go abroad, their profit margins go up. But then they found if they go further abroad, so if they don't go next door or within you know, a certain you know, hundreds of miles or a couple thousand miles, um, that then their profit margins start to go back down. So if they go to the other side of the world, their profits start to decline. And they call this actually, they call it the globalization penalty. So I think there's a whole host of reasons why, yes, you can grow faster, you can make more, higher quality and more affordable products if you go abroad, because you can get economies of scale, you can have new markets, um, you can have different labor and, and cost of labor and, and skill sets and all of that. Um, but you go too far abroad and these other frictions just make it hard, and you tend to, you know, maybe you don't lose money, but you don't be as profitable as you might be. Okay. Um, there are obviously very different histories of how the different regions in the world came to be more integrated. Um, and as you said in the beginning, North America is less integrated than, than Europe, certainly, and even, even most of Asia. So um, tell us a little bit about how, why that's the case, and does it really matter, given the scale of the United States and opportunities within yeah. this or our own country. Yeah, so the paths can be different, and we see that. So the European path I sort of just described, and it was very top-down, diplomats, you know, 
uh, leaders talking to each other and forming the rules to make it easier to trade with each other, to build things together, to sell to each other, to finance each other and the like. Asia is a really different story. It's much more, it's not about free trade agreements. It's not about you know, governments talking to each other. It's really more of a bottom up commercial story. And it started with Japan in the post-war period running out of labor quickly while they were rebuilding and beginning to you know, outsource or you know, send, send factories to, at the time, very poor South Korea and Taiwan and, and Singapore and places like that. And then once those countries began to climb the socioeconomic scale, they became wealthier, they had more technology, they began doing the same thing. South Korea and Taiwan started going out and, and sourcing parts from you know, Vietnam, from China, from Thailand from other places. So you see it, it's CEOs that were making this decision. Now, governments helped. They gave kind of an assist with um, you know, overseas development assistance. They might go and build a port so that then you know, Japanese, the Japanese you know, government would build a port in South Korea so then their companies could get stuff back out. They would help build infrastructure and the like. But it was really companies that were making this decision. Free trade agreements came along much later, and it, already some of this integration had, had really happened. And when you turn to North America, you know, we're sort of in this, this Goldilocks middle, but not in a good way, um, in that we don't have the deep integration of Europe where you have all of the rules that allow countries to come together. You know, we don't have one passport. We don't have, uh, you know, one currency. We didn't get rid of regulations. We got rid of tariffs, but not really regulations between the countries. There's lots of frictions there. Um, but so we don't have that. But we also we have some industries that have integrated, and automotive industry is is one of the most integrated. Aerospace, there's a good amount of connections. There's processed foods. There's some others there, but but it's fewer. It's much fewer than Asia. It's not as broad as the electronics industry or the apparel industry or or some of these others. And I think that's part of the reason why we've seen um, many of those industries decamp and leave North America. Is you didn't have the ability or you didn't set up these supply chains that connected the three economies. And so it became more profitable and more competitive to make them in Asia. And so you see that across Asia from those who make synthetic threads that then get woven into fabrics that then are dyed and then are made into apparel that are then sent out that we're all, we're all wearing or some of us are wearing. Um, so I think there's different paths there. And the North America path, while it's brought some benefits in particular sectors and, and particular um, you know, communities. Um, it hasn't been as widespread, and that's been one of the challenges, I think, frankly, for for U.S. growth as well as Mexican and Canadian. And how, from a North American standpoint, how much did NAFTA influence this? You know, NAFTA was a big part of it, and um, I uh, let me tell you a, a sort of tale of two cities in the United States. So I grew up in Akron, Ohio, um, which at one point was the rubber capital of the world. It made you know one out of two tires that were produced globally. It was booming town in the 50s, 60s, early 70s, um, and then it began to hit pretty hard times. Um, it started facing stiff competition from Japanese tire makers and their car companies that they followed. It faced competition from European tire makers. Uh, and by 1982, the last tire came off of an assembly line in Akron, Ohio, and, and it hit, it is become often, you know, defined as one of those examples of, of the Rust Belt. Um, and also one would say sort of a victim of globalization. So that's, you know, one community. Um, the other community that I would contrast with it is uh, about four hour drive away, it's Columbus, Indiana. So Columbus, Indiana is a similar sized town or, or city at the time. It's the home of Cummins Engines, so big engine machinery, um, driving machinery and, and trucks and cars and the like. Um, they had sort of a similar post-war boom. They hit tough times in the 70s and early 80s because they were facing Japanese competitors that were more efficient and, and reliable. They were losing out you know, to contracts to Ford and others because of Japanese as well as Europeans. Um, but they were able to hang on through the 80s. And in the 1990s, arguably, NAFTA saved them. Because of NAFTA, they were able to uh, divide up their production. They could send some labor intensive to Mexico. Um, so their costs came down so they could compete for contracts with the Japanese and, and others who had this diversified you know, regional supply chains in Asia. They also got access to the Mexican market, which they'd never have. And now they're the biggest uh, truck engine manufacturer in Mexico, or four Mexican trucks. Um, they're all made actually in upstate New York, um, but they are the, you know, the brand. If you're behind a Mexican truck um, in Mexico, it's probably a Cummins engine. Um, and now they're back to you know, a multi-billion dollar company and, and really survived. And you know, I think the difference there, I would say, between those two is 
Akron had a lot of challenges, but one of the challenges they had was limited regionalization, not globalization, but limited regionalization. So in the 1970s and 80s, they were competing against Japan that was sourcing from all over East Asia and building things with economies of scale there. They were facing France's Michelin and Germany's Continental, who had the European community, which was sort of the predecessor to the EU. And so they had scale there in terms of the countries that were part of that club. And Akron and the United States were on their own. They didn't have sort of that diversity of, of you know, economies and markets and, and skills and labor. Um, and they couldn't compete at the time, um, while Cummins was able to. So I think a bit of the story of NAFTA is that it actually helped many of the industries that took advantage of it compete. Now, some jobs that meant go to Mexico, but it meant the company survived vis-a-vis -vis competitors who were already had created you know, these ties and these, these supply chains. Um, and in some cases, it meant that they actually thrived and they had meant bigger sales, more sales, because they were competitive. Um, so more jobs were created in the US than would have been if they had just had a uh, supply chain or if they had just created the things in one country. Hmm. And how much of the story of Columbus is a coming story? Is that fundamentally their leadership decisions and their competitive context that set yeah. them on a different path than Akron? It's partly leadership. Um, it's partly, I do think it's partly they were able to hang in there um, until they could, they had sort of NAFTA to work with, so they could diversify and they had access to other markets. So it's partly that story. Um, it is partly, um, you know, 1980s trade wars between the Reagan administration and the Japanese. They put in some, you know, limits on engines that were allowed to come and go at various times. So they gave them a little breathing room, which didn't happen with tires. But, um, but I do think a big part of their continued success, even after that moment, is this regionalization and the fact that you can, I mean, whether we like it or not in the United States, manufacturing, global manufacturing has become a team sport. Nobody does it alone anymore. Even the United States, even China. China doesn't manufacture by itself. And so you're competing against these, these supply chains that have been created that are very efficient, that are highly innovative, um, that bring you know, low cost goods. And so if you try to do it all in one place without sort of that diversity of, of labor or finance or skills or technology or patents or all of these things, then um, you just won't be profitable vis-a-vis -vis the others and you'll lose market share. Um, and so I think that is what, you know, Cummins and others, and, and many of the industries that have been thriving in North America, that's what, part of what they figured out. Okay. Um, the uh, depiction of North America's challenges on this front, you articulated partly as the nature of where the companies were and that there were um, different kinds of uh, regional integration that were going on in Europe and Asia that created different competitive set. How much of North America, and particularly the U.S. challenge on this, is a political one about a history of not feeling like that's a good idea generally? I mean, I think it is a challenge for the United States, right? And, and we, um, if I dare say, I think the U.S. got a little complacent in the sense that we had you know, a booming manufacturing economy in the 1950s and 60s and early 70s. And for lots of reasons, we had lots of amazing technology. We had a lot of investment in research and development. We had you know, a great working population. We had all of these things that were happening at that time. We had you know, women and minorities able to come into the workforce. We had expanding workforce um, and a broader part of the workforce. Um, but one of the reasons we were so successful in that time period is that Europe and Asia had been so beaten down by the war. We didn't have any competition, right? The, you know, the Europeans could barely feed themselves as they were trying to bring their economies back from a devastating war. Japan faced a similar challenge, and you know, China had taken itself out of the game because it went behind a Maoist wall. So did you know the Soviet Union. It really was a place where we were kind of it on, on that stage. And when you start seeing some of the challenges of the 70s and 80s in the US, um, and you know, growing up in Akron and other places, you saw that, um, it was in part because there were, again, other competitors. And so I think part of our challenge, and I think we are making strides in this, is, is adjusting to the world today, right? There's a lot of talented companies, people, countries um, that you know, are, are very competitive that we can compete with, but we need to step it up. Um, so I think that's part of it. And then the other part is, you know, how do we do that? And, and you know, one of the 
challenges, I think, today in our politics is we're sort of fighting the last war, um, particularly as it, has, um, as it pertains to globalization. And you know, one of the, the biggest effects we've seen over this last 20 years, but really the first decade of the 21st century was what economists call the China shock, right? You had this huge economy that came in, it joined the WTO, and just its size reverberated through the global economy and, and was detrimental for, for big parts of the United States. You know, in different measures by economists, but somewhere between one and two million US jobs were, were lost during that time because of China's competition, and really because of Asia's competition, but China was the, was the last stop and just this big, huge economy coming in. Um, but that's not going to be the challenge of the next 10 years, right? China does not have a labor force in waiting of hundreds of millions that are in the you know, countryside that are going to come into urban factories. Um, in fact, over the next 15 years, China is going to lose 100 million people from its labor force. So it is going to be shrinking, not growing. Um, and as we were talking about before, wages in China are, are already growing and, and, and are already at rates where it's not a low cost producer anymore. So what I worry about our political debates is we're, we're looking back and we're hearkening back to, well, we want to go back to the 1950s and 60s when we made everything, but that was a particular time. Or we're hearkening back and saying, oh, you know, the challenge is the early 2000s and, and we, we have to stop that from happening, so we're gonna put up protectionist barriers. But that's not gonna be the challenge, and so it's not gonna help us grow in the next decade. Okay. Um, just a reminder of those in the room or online, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat on YouTube or on the cards, and we'll be getting to those shortly. Um, so the speaking of fighting the last war, um, how does, uh, Brexit fit in all of this in terms of the the path that Europe is is on. Yeah, it's kind of the worst decision ever for <laughs> the Brits, and you know, but you know, it's been interesting. So since Brexit has happened, is is a couple of things. One is. Um, you see that the British economy has slowed, and it's been the slowest growing economy in all of Europe uh, since Brexit happened, so through COVID. It's barely recovered uh, you know, since what it lost during COVID. Um, even its own government, when you look at the reports from, from you know, the, um, the exchequer and you look at the reports from the, the British government, they think they will grow slower, right? They think structurally they've lost the ability to grow in, in many ways. Um, and you see you know, many headquarters of companies leaving London, leaving Britain, because they no longer have access to the European Union the way they used to. Um, you know, my, my favorite example is you know, Lloyd's of London is no longer based in London. Um, so you know, there's challenges there. Um, and then the other side, you have actually seen the European Union, those that stayed in the European Union, you've seen them coalesce uh, much more tightly than you had before. And so before Brexit, there were lots of countries that were having very similar discussions, you know, lots of far right or far left groups that wanted to get out of the EU that thought it was, you know, a challenge. And, and since then, it's, it's interesting, a lot of that rhetoric has changed. And even, you know, politicians or parties like Le Pen in France and others, they no longer talk about leaving the EU. They want to change it, they want to reform it, but they're talking about staying because I think Brexit was such a firm and really black and white example of the costs of leaving because you no longer have access to, in a preferred way, to you know, 450 million people in the way that, that you used to. And, and um, I think unfortunately for, for Britain, um, you know, it's gonna be hard to come back in, even if they would want to, you know, it's, it's a long process. Um, so COVID happened, uh, as we all know, <laughs> uh, got the, as you said, the, the phrase global supply chain on the lips of uh, the average person and certainly um, raised a fair amount of concern from elected officials and, and others trying to navigate through the, the, the pandemic. But uh, was that indicative of something more concerning about the fragility of supply chains or was, or was that something that was unique to the circumstances? So, I mean, COVID was in some ways unique in that you had a almost unprecedented or once in a, once in a century shock to supply as, you know, port shut, airplanes stayed down, you know, everybody went back to their house or, or you know, were quarantined. So you had that side. You had a, you know, once in a generation or once in a long time shock to demand as people stopped buying luggage and they started buying laptops and leisure wear. You know, you started seeing people buying different things. And then you had sort of a once in a very long time shock to logistics as, 
you know, ships were on the wrong side of the ocean for who wanted what, and, and you didn't have, you know, so much of the system kind of fell down. Um, and I would say, yes, we saw the fragility of supply chains on one side, but I actually think the lesson coming out a couple of years later is that supply chains are more robust than we think. Because even with these, you know, once in a century, unprecedented demand, supply, and logistic shocks, we pretty much had everything back in the stores within three months, right? We had toilet paper and we had laptops and we had things. So sure, there were slowdowns, but they actually managed to to supply these things. And you know, I mean, one kind of incredible feat I would say is that you know, China in May of 2020 produced more masks, more PPE masks. Um, in that month than the whole world had created in the whole year before. So there's a scale and got them out to the world. And so, so I think in some ways, yes, they showed how just one border closing or one, you know, one piece not showing up, you know, created chaos in some supply chains, but they also showed that these are actually pretty resilient and efficient and, and profitable. So, you know, they kept going. So I think we kind of learned two lessons from that. I mean, one thing I think that COVID, COVID just accelerated other factors that were beginning to change the way companies located their production and the way supply chains worked. And so in the 2010s, you started seeing companies change the way they thought about producing and where they thought about producing because they started seeing more and more automation come into the process. So robots coming into the process or algorithms and software and AI now, but you started to see a lot of that. So people were no longer looking necessarily for the lowest wage cost because really the way they set up their factories had a lot more to do with automation. So that started to change some calculations. Um, you saw companies starting to see the demographics and, you know, Chinese labor wasn't cheap anymore and other places in the world that had been, you know, affordable no longer were so affordable or their markets were in other places. So they didn't want to be exactly where they were or maybe they wanted to put excess capacity somewhere else. So that began to change things. Along with COVID, you've seen um, climate change begin to change the way people think about their supply chains. Um, both the effects of climate change, you know, seas are rising, so do we really want to depend on ports and certain ports won't be effective or the like, but also the policies towards climate change. You see um, many countries are starting to talk about carbon border adjustment taxes where, you know, if, if they're going to test your emissions and they're going to charge you, if you're, you know, where you make something has, you know, dirty energy or the cost of that transport, the carbon footprint. So you're starting to see people say, if I produce on the other side of the world, I'm going to have to pay a tax if I bring it into Europe or I bring it into other places. So you're starting to see this move around. And then, I mean, COVID sort of also coincided with a lot of geopolitics. <laughs> so, you know, before COVID, we had Trump tariffs. Those are still in place. They're now Biden tariffs. And then we've seen obviously kind of a ratcheting up of of the you know export controls and other kinds of frictions between the US and China and, and other places so so changing just the profits of, of particular supply chains if you if you cross those those borders so there's a lot going on there at the same time it's hard to disentangle it's all very of hard it, yeah but some of them were more fundamental trends like demography and kind of core automation and things that um, may have been shifted somewhat by by COVID, but we're, we're continuing. And yeah. so when you look forward and think about how this might play out, uh, how, how do you, is there different scenarios about how this might play out in your mind? Is there one dominant one? How do you think about yeah. how the global integration or disintegration could, is gonna play itself out? So I see, so as I look at these last 40 years, I, it has been much more to me regionalization that happened than globalization. Um, so we already have that. It's not as if everybody has been connected, the world has been totally flat. It's already been you know, a little bumpy and, and sort of these, these clusterings. And I think that will continue. Um, some of these trends like automation and 3D printing and things would say, hey, you can produce stuff anywhere. It doesn't, you know, you don't, it could be on the other side of the world or, or not. Um, the rise of services, you say, oh, things can be digitally sent across. You don't have any transportation costs. You don't have to worry about that. But I do think that some of these factors still lead you back to a much more regional world, not necessarily a domestic world. Some will, right? 3D printing, you could make something here and you don't have to send it anywhere. Um, but what will more often happen is that these economies of scale, all these other things that come to allow you to make high quality, affordable goods, the international side will still matter. It's gonna be very hard for any country, even with you know all this capital and things to be able to make things as affordable alone as they will uh, across you know number of countries and with specialization and the like, 
but some of the disparity or sort of you know diversity in where things are geographic, I think will become more cumbersome, and particularly the geopolitics, I don't see ending anytime soon. If anything, I think we're at the beginning of this fragmentation rather than than the end of it. Um, and whether that is you know the u s China picking increasing number of sectors that they want to separate from each other. And you know, we hear in the United States, the United States has laid out things like semiconductors and critical minerals and electric vehicle batteries and, and pharmaceuticals as, as four particular industries that they want to have control of. They want it either to be here or they want it to be in places where they trust that they'll be able to get those products. You know, if we have another pandemic, we want to make sure we'll be able to get the vaccines or the, or, you know, the medicines that we need. Um, same with electric vehicle batteries and all of that. So part of it will be that. Um, but I think we'll start to see more and more industries. And it's not just the United States. China has been pulling back as well, right? They have decided that there are particular industries they want to control, that they want to make sure they have the technology. They don't want to import it from the United States or Europe. They want to make sure that they really have national security, security the way we think about it as well. So given that these two sides are, are, are drifting apart and, and putting more and more policies in place, I think we're going to see more and more fragmentation. And it's not going to be just physical goods. It's going to be services and digital goods. And, you know, we already see some regionalization in services. So, you know, a big part of services is tourism. And when people go abroad, they tend to go closer by, right? So, you know, 75% of the people who take European vacations are Europeans. <laughs> you know, in Asia, it's even tighter. It's, you know, the people that are traveling in Asia are, are Asians. And, and same North America. You, you know, more Americans go to Mexico and Mexicans come to the United States than, than really anywhere else we go. So you already see that. Um, but when you get into, you know, data and services and social media, you know, there's divides there as well. And part of it is, is rules, right? You know, Facebook and other, you know, um, uh, social media platforms don't operate in China because they're not allowed to, right? And we have data rules being put in place that make it very hard to move data in and out of China or in and out of other countries. So I think even there, these rules will stop kind of the globalization of what should be easy to transport around the world because it's costless or it seems to be costless. We're going to see fragmentation. And I think there too, you're going to see some regionalization because of the free trade agreements, because of the other ties that tend to develop around regions. Okay. So a number of questions come in. So please uh, either write them on a card or uh, put them in the the uh, comments section on YouTube, and we'll get to those. And I'm going to weave them in as I go here. So um, if I hear you correctly in what you were just articulating in terms of the other factors that may push this, that almost all of those tend to push us more towards regionalization. Yeah. And uh, so if you're um, a policymaker trying to think about this, um, are things like the new industrial policy in the United States or the concerns about um, protection of uh, technology for national security. Mm -hmm. um, is that smart? Is that going to increase? Or what, what do you, how do you see all of that playing? Yes, as you see these debates play out, if you're just an economist and you're just out there, you're like, this is really dumb. We should just be sourcing from everywhere and we should take every part and, and that's the way we get our best products at the most affordable um, prices. And that's probably true, right? If, if the world was all, you know, if that was the way we viewed the world, but, but we don't view the world there, right? And we are only, our, the goal of efficiency, economic efficiency or low cost, you know, goods is not the only goal, right? And, and so, especially right now, there's a big goal for national security. We want to make sure we're going to be able to have semiconductors. We want to make sure, you know, if tensions would heat up with, you know, we saw with Russia, we see with China, you know, if those things happen, we want to make sure we have access to those goods. So we want some resilience and, and that's one thing. We also, as a, you know, nation and as a world have decided that we want to slow climate change, that that is a goal. So the, that is a goal that's out there. And so to do that, well, we need to put in policies that change our energy matrices. We need to put in policies that change, you know, our transportation, change our buildings. There's lots of things there. So that's not a just lowest cost. That's, you know, that's a different goal that we have there. You know, we also have a goal here, or, or at least the Biden administration has a goal for what he, you know, they call domestic equity, right? We want to have um, growth. We want to have it be inclusive growth. We want to have, you know, good paying jobs. We don't, it doesn't, we don't want just the lowest coming down or we want that as well. And there's others. And, you know, in a pass after COVID, we want to make sure that public health works, that, you know, we have access and it's equitable. And if there's another pandemic um, that 
all Americans will have access to whatever will help them get through that pandemic. So there's a lot of goals that are out there. So as I look at industrial policy, it's not just economic competitiveness or can we make these products, it's can we cool the world? Can we be ready for the next pandemic? Can we you know, make communities a bit more equitable? There's all these goals there. Um, now, lots of goals can lead to complicated policy <laughs> and, 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 and hard to know if you've actually, if it works, right, if it's successful. But, but as I look out, um, as the US tries to do this, then the question is, okay, how might we at least best try to set this up? And, and I think the, the challenge for the US is there are very few industries or sectors that the US government is going to be able to subsidize indefinitely, to a large extent and indefinitely. Maybe semiconductors, because lots of countries do that, um, and it's seen as a, you know, a defense national security, but, but we're not gonna subsidize dozens of industries. They're gonna have to stand on their own in the, you know, in the global world and be profitable in the global world. And it's going to be very hard to do that just in one place, even the United States, which is, you know, huge economy and population and all of that. And so you're going to have to find allies. Um, and for some of these national security concerns, we want to make electric vehicle batteries, let's say, because we want to cool the climate or we want to stop climate change. You know, we just don't have the critical minerals here in the United States or, or not enough. So we're going to have to work with other countries that make these, right? Um, but then you get back to these economies of scale. Are we going to be really doing every single niche along all of these paths? And are we going to be able to do them effectively and affordably and also innovatively? And I think the jury would be out on that. Perhaps the answer is no, right? You're going to need partners. You're going to need others. You're going to need, you know, broader labor forces and scientists and, and, and all kinds of other workers to learn through this process. And so there you want to reach out to others. So I think, you know, the advice for the policymakers is as we write these industrial policies, as we think about setting them up, how do you make sure that it doesn't become, it does meet national security goals. It does meet climate change goals, right? It goes, it, it gets at those things, but it isn't so limiting or so protecting that it becomes counterproductive where you, you might be able to make an electric vehicle battery, but it's not gonna be a good one. And so out in the rest of the world, the US batteries won't be competitive, right? And I think that is, that's the challenge. And one part of that path is to think a little bit more regionally, to think a little bit more about who would be the allies or the others that you would include under that club. So you get some of the economies of scale and the innovation and, and the manufacturing, um, but you also can meet some of those other goals. It um, sounds like a very complicated message to communicate to the average voter. Um, how does a, a well-meaning uh, leader uh, or an advisor to, to yeah. those leaders who's um, you know, concerned about national security and cares about it, concerned about climate change, um, concerned about uh, international competitiveness in a way, how do you communicate that in a way that is sensible policy but just doesn't feel like we're going protectionist walls everywhere and you know america first again yeah i mean the debate in washington isn't um always the best in this case um, you know one thing i would start with is when you see polls of americans and you know gallup and others do these really you know big polls you know they show that americans actually are generally a good strong majority of americans actually think trade is an opportunity it's not a threat so i think there's already a base there that would be receptive to a different message than sometimes we we hear coming out of washington so i think that's part of it i think the other part is that you know a surprising number of of people who um you know whether it's services, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's other jobs, they actually don't realize they're tied to the international economy. So there's a little bit of education to be done by, by companies and say, actually, our final consumer is somewhere else. And, and you know, exports are actually, you know, we have lots of studies that show that export-oriented jobs in the U.S. pay more than jobs that are, that are domestically focused, somewhere between 8 and 20%. So, you know, if, if politicians want to create good jobs and export-oriented jobs are the good jobs that, you know, they, they want to bring to their communities. So I think there is, you know, there is a story to tell of, of, okay, how do we bring good jobs to community? Well, let's see if we can tap into those, you know, seven point, what, 7.7 .7 billion other people that are in the world and sell to just a fraction of them, right? And that's how you're going to be able to do it. Or maybe you're a supplier into a, a, you know, a factory in Mexico that's assembling and then sends out to the world. So that, you know, Mexico having a factory that, factory that assembles cars is not something that's going to hurt Americans. It can actually help Americans. Um, and one thing that's really interesting here, especially for the U.S. and back to Washington is 
the U.S. actually has very few free trade agreements around the world. And we, so as a result, we have very limited preferred access to other markets, you know, access where we don't pay tariffs. So we have preferred access to less than 10% of the globe's GDP. Now, Mexico and Canada are NAFTA, now it's called USMCA because they renegotiated it, but they have preferred access to 60% of the globe's GDP. So if there's a car factory or assembly plant in Mexico, they can send that car to Europe um, and it can be sold in Europe without any tariffs. If there is an assembly factory in the United States, in North Carolina, and they send that car from North Carolina um, to Europe, the, they will pay a 10% tariff. So that car will not be competitive in a European market because it's just too, too expensive. Um, so if US suppliers can put, you know, US engines, Cummins engines can put that engine in the Mexican assembled car, they can sell it to the Europeans and actually, you know, access this market that's, you know, 480 million people. Um, Mexico is also part of the, C the CPTPP, what used to be the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and then they added a, a CP, a comprehensive uh, and progressive to the beginning of it. Um, but that was a trade agreement that the U.S. had negotiated and then, and then pulled out of. Um, so when we now trade with lots of Asian countries, we face tariffs, some double-digit tariffs that Mexico and Canada don't. So, so as I think about how, how do we grow our markets, how do we grow our exports, okay, we can trade directly with countries with final goods, um, but we actually will probably get more bang for our buck if we supply parts and components that go into products in other places that have much better access to the world. Okay. Um, a lot of the, the discussion at the time and still about the impact of North American trade agreements tend to focus on U.S. and Mexico. Yeah. But a big portion of it is U.S. and Canada. Um, how is that actually working, and how does is there are there lessons learned there for for um, U.S. and Canadian competitiveness? There are. I mean, it's interesting. So Mexico and Canada are the U.S. biggest export markets. Um, so that's where we export the most. Um, and there are a lot of complementarities. I think one thing we learned with Canada and the U.S. actually is that you can be similar economies in many ways. You don't have to have a low wage and a high wage to find complementarities. There are there, um, but you can also find complementarities and strength in, you know, in your manufacturing between you know, the US and Canada. The Europeans do this as well. They find it within each other. So you know, we do see a lot of cross-border exchanges with Canada in automotive. That's another place where you know, it's, it's sort of, that one is really a, a North America industry. We see it in energy. We see it in some processed foods and the like. I mean, there's a lot of areas where, there's, um, where there are sort of benefits. You know, one of the challenges of NAFTA, um, and sort of back to why it's not, it's sort of, Goldilocks, but, but not the one that we want, is that yes, it got rid of tariffs, but it didn't get rid of regulations. And so the North American production still has a lot of, of challenges um, to, to making things that cross borders. And you know, one of, one of my favorite, I mean, favorite and like, you've gotta be kidding examples is, um, so Cheerios that are made in Canada can't be sold in the United States because they don't meet our regulations. So there's too many, you know, there's too many regulations there. And that carries over into aspirin that's manufactured in Canada can't be sold here in the United States, right? And that's sort of the FDA and medicines, but Cheerios doesn't seem like medicine unless right. you have a three-year-old. So, uh, so this is, you know, this is a challenge. You still have these regulations and, and the US, Canada, and Mexico have not been able to really negotiate these away the way the Europeans did, frankly. Okay, so as you look forward to um, the U.S.'s outlook in the kind of world that you're describing, what would be the top two or three things that you would suggest to policymakers and business leaders that they ought to be paying a lot more attention to yeah. to be successful in this environment? Well, the first thing I would say is that I actually think this next decade can be really good for the United States. Some of the things that led companies to China, to Asia, and the like um, won't necessarily be what the next 10 years look like. Automation should help higher wage economies, right? Um, demographics, the North America has pretty good demographics compared to lots of other places in the world. And climate change, some of these issues should be things that the United States, we could build, and we are working on building a you know, cleaner energy matrix and the like. And so I think there's lots that we can do here. And you know, lots of the automation, lots of the, the sort of intangibles that go into lots of the technology and the like, the US has been leading on that, especially in you know, cloud computing. And, and there's a lot of areas where there's so many strengths in the US. We have great universities. We have a, such a great base. So one is I wouldn't, I wouldn't despair. 
Um, but I also think, you know, time is of the essence and this is a moment because of all of these shocks that we're seeing a once in a generation fluidity to supply chains. It, things are moving around the world. There's a reshuffling that's going around. It's, it's not gonna last forever because one thing about supply chains is once you set up kind of the way of making things, you don't, they're very sticky because it's hard to set things up, right? You can, sure, you and I can go to China today and start saying, well, I guess I wanna make, you know, I wanna make this glass, How do? I, but you have to find someone, you have to find a factory, you have to trust them, you have to make sure they deliver things on time and they pay you or you pay them and it's complicated. So once you get it go up and going, you're, you're reluctant to change. So right now is this moment around the world, and this is not just for the US, but for lots of countries. It's a moment around the world where you can get back in the game, where you can, you can grab some of that that, you know, production and manufacturing and services and, and growth and, and, you know, innovation. Um, but to do that, I think, you know, the, the challenge here is one, um, focus on things that will make you generally competitive. So, you know, the U.S. needs an infrastructure upgrade. We've allocated a lot of money that's on its way, but, um, but a lot of that needs for logistics, for, for other sides. That's one part. Two is the U.S. Um, has these, you know, some of the most amazing universities in the world and, and you know, some of, you know, the, the cutting edge PhDs and all of that. But, you know, I don't think our schools are up for a 21st century workforce, right? We're, the jobs that are coming that will come here or come back or be developed are not going to be the ones of, of the 20th century. They're not going to be pulling tires off of an assembly line in Akron, Ohio. So education is a big part of that. Um, I would argue that we should be thinking about a continental workforce. Um, so thinking about how we balance with other countries that we're tied to in these supply chains. You know, if it, if it breaks down in Mexico, then it's gonna affect the factory in the United States and, and vice versa. So education is, is a big part of that and should be a focus of the US. Um, and then as we put in specific policies, like we, uh, you know, the Biden administration and the Congress has passed bipartisan, passed, you know, hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars in to, you know, fund semiconductor chips, to fund electric vehicle batteries, to change you know, electricity grids. As we think about those and the supply and the components that are gonna go in, um, we should think about making sure that they're sourced from more than just one country, more than just the United States, because that will allow it to happen faster and, and probably be more innovative and more efficient. Okay. Um, in the world that you're describing, we haven't talked a lot about what happens to um, South America, what happens to Africa in a yeah. world of you know, three global anchors? What, uh, what, where, does, where does that leave them? Yeah, so these are regions that I would say um, were really left out of the globalization of the last 30, 40 years. They you know, did not, many of them, increase you know, trade as part of their economy, and they didn't really benefit. You see them muddle through in terms of economic growth, um, and particularly in terms of inclusive growth. You, know, you don't see, you know, the economies are very unequal and, and have lots of challenges, economic and political, because of that. Um, and you know, part of this, I would argue, is, uh, is because of limited regionalization. These are regions of the world where the vast majority of their trade, you know, 85 or 90 percent of their trade, is not with their neighbors. When they trade, they look out. And one of the challenges that's happened to them is they have commodities, so they, they end up on the ends of supply chains. So they send out commodities, and they bring back finished goods. And so they don't really get to be part of this sort of meaty middle of the supply chain. And that is where you get technology, that's where you get learning by doing, that's where you get innovation, that's where you get better jobs, more sophisticated jobs, more diversity in terms of your economy, and, and you get faster and more inclusive growth. And you know, economists call this uh, premature deindustrialization. And so South America and Africa have been the you know, the, those hit hardest by this in all of the world. But it basically means that before you become a wealthy economy, you lose your manufacturing sector, you see it decline. And, and part of that, I think, is this lack of regional supply chains. They've just ended up on the ends and they haven't been able to sort of fill that spot except for in a few cases. So, so what does this mean for those? Can they, can they rejoin? You know, I think right now is a moment for the United States, but it's a moment for, for these continents or, or these countries to try to get back into it, right? Yeah, as we see a reshuffling, um, how do you, you know, can they rejoin um, supply chains or can they bring some of them to bring the benefit to their economies, to their companies and to their economies? And so, yes, I think there's a potential there. Um, there are things they need to do, right? You need to lower logistics costs because, because that matters, right? As 
expensive to move things around South, South America and around Africa. Um, you need to train workforces that can work in these kind of industries. If you're going to try to bring some of this production there, you have to make sure that, that people can do it. Um, you have the challenges of economies of scale, so you're going to need regionalization. Nobody's going to, you know, make a, you know, an iPhone in, in Asia but take one part from Argentina. That's not how it's going to work. You have to be able to bring the whole thing um, or much of, of the chain here for, or to a particular region to, to make that work. So there's a lot of things that they need to think about, but one of it is to develop those ties with their neighbors, um, and that would be a way for them to be competitive and be attractive, frankly, to, to these companies that are thinking about moving in other places. I would say some of these geopolitics can favor some of these places, in Africa and South America in particular, because um, as we see the green transition begin to happen, these are two places that have lots of the building blocks of, of green technologies, right? They have lithium and copper and cobalt and graphite and, and other, you know, inputs in there. So there's a moment where um, they could really benefit. But I think the question is, do these become just another set of commodities that they ship out to the world to be processed and used? Or can they find ways to take some of that value out and have it happen in maybe not in each country, but in each region to the benefit of, of you know, South America or Africa? Okay. Um, some of those countries also have demographic advantages to in an aging world. Yes. Um, you know, you've, you've, in addition to writing this book, you spend most of your time as a Latin American scholar. Yeah. So are there bright spots that, that you'd like to point to to say this is an example of things that feel like this, we should be seeing more of this? I mean, I think there are, there are some governments who are trying to do this. I mean, there's, you know, the world is having challenges with populist governments and Latin America and Africa are no exception right now. So, so I'm, I'm not Pollyannish about this, but I do think there are, you know, governments, some of them are progressive that are trying to work through institutions to bring broader growth. And, you know, I'll focus first on Latin America and say a word about Africa, but, you know, Latin America for all of its challenges, and we can just go, we could talk about that for an hour, like the challenges there, but I think the one thing we should give credit to Latin America is that it has the most people living under democracy of any region in the world. This is an area, and it's a you know, lower and middle income countries that have managed to keep democracies. Now, it's not always pretty, and there's challenges and the like, but this really is a region that has managed to keep democracy alive. And that, to me, in the long run, you know, brings a moderating influence. You don't get, you know, you get incremental reform, which is never satisfying, um, but it does mean that you, you don't get these wild swings that you might get in other places with regimes that are, you know, more authoritarian. Um, you know, whether that wild swing is something like Russia or, or whether it's like China. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad, sometimes you don't know. But, but I think there's a fundamental basis there in Latin America that should be good in the long run for markets um, because they're finding ways through to give people voice and, and, and provide um, livelihoods in, and through a democratic process. So, so I think there's a benefit there, but it's a little ugly right now in some of the places as people are frustrated with what's, and especially what's happened in COVID there, where this really was the region that was hit hardest in terms of per capita deaths from COVID um, and then also just effects on the economy. Africa has Many challenges too, as we know, um, but, but as you mentioned, that is the one demographic superstar of the next 20 years. And you know, fast forward 15, 20 years, Nigeria will be the second largest country in terms of population in the world. They're gonna have 900 million people if, if demographics continue the way they are. They're gonna pass China. Right? It's going to be India, Nigeria, and then China. So as you think about this, this could be, um, you know, dem demographers talk about it, the demographic bonus, right? You get all these people coming into the workforce and you don't have as many old people and you don't have as many young people. So these people are all working age and, and could, you know, just can superstar your economy, right? They could, they could rocket it off. Um, but that's only if the opportunities are there, right? And so I think the challenge for governments there and companies is how do you take advantage of all of these young people, how do you educate them? How do you provide opportunities so that they can use that energy and, and prowess that they're gonna have for the next 30 or 40 years to, to really make African nations middle income and, and high income countries. And, and there, you know, we'll see, or otherwise you'll see lots of migration around the world. You'll see, you know, other kinds of political instability and the like. Um, Let alone climate migration as a result of. Climate migration as well, right? Um, so I think that is, uh, 
is, is a huge challenge that has to be faced. Um, I have a great colleague at the Council on Foreign Relations who's writing a book about, about Africa, Michelle Gavin. Um, and the other thing that she points to that's interesting is Africa is one of the places of the last 30, 40 years that has had the most sclerotic political leadership. The same people have been ruling country after country or their children have been ruling country after country. And as you see this big demographic burst, it's hard to imagine that that stability you've seen at the top from independence days in some places will, will remain. And so maybe it opens up a you know, more democratic and, and, and better Africa, but maybe it also means a lot of political instability. Um, there was a specific question about Cuba. Um, yeah. Not part of supply chains, but I'm happy to chat about okay. it. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, so, what's happening? Or yeah, what, uh, and, and you know, is the, the U.S. playing the right kind of role we should be vis-a-vis -vis Cuba these days? Yeah, well, Cuba is uh, unfortunately a, a domestic issue for the United States um, and, and centers often on Florida and Florida politics um, in the way we uh, work with Cuba. And as, as I think everybody knows, it's you know, been... I guess what sixty over sixty years, far over sixty years now that we've had a, a you know an embargo and and so limited ties with Cuba, and we've seen ebbs and flows in relations. You know, in the Obama administration, you saw an opening in terms of visits and finance and and trade and the like. Under the Trump administration, the closed back down. We're starting to see a bit more opening um, from the Biden administration with a few you know allowing money and and remittances and things to flow back and forth. You know, I think one of the biggest challenges, frankly, for changing that relationship is that it isn't reciprocated on the Cuban side. Um, and particularly during the more open years under the Obama administration, while at first there was a lot of interchange, um, the Cuban government pretty quickly started pushing back and, and, and not allowing kind of, you know, visitors, but, but really more commerce and, and exchanges and the like to set up on the island because they really want to keep a very tight political and economic control. So um, there probably are a lot of things the U.S. should do, and it is probably time to get rid of the, you know, the embargo and, and start over. But I think one of the big challenges is, is that the other side doesn't actually want that um, because of the way they are. That's one of the ways that they keep such tight control of, of their population. Okay. Um, I will say Cuba is one of the places, since we're talking about demographics, one of the worst demographic cliffs in the world. It is a country that is suffering for lots of reasons. One, because lots of Cubans left. Um, two, because lots of Cubans still leave. And in fact, at the US-Mexico southern border, a big number, tens of thousands of, are Cubans that are trying to come in. So that's a big part of the people coming. It's not just Mexican, Central Americans, but Cubans are a big part. Um, and the third is, this is a country that um, has not built any infrastructure since 1960. Um, and so people, it's very hard for people to go and, and start families because there's nowhere to move, right? You, you end up, there's no new apartments. You end up living with your parents and, and, and that's not always amenable to having lots of kids, let's say. <laughs> that sounds discouraging. Um, <laughs> so uh, if you're an observer as you are of the, these phenomena and you're trying to understand is, um, what are markers for things that you look at that say this is going in the direction that should be? That says, but you know, is it reshoring of manufacturing? I'm making this up. Yeah. You know, what what are the things that you pay attention to? And then and the opposite. What what are things that, if you see that happening, you ought to be worried about? Yeah. So one is is sort of nearshoring, reshoring, and and I think we're seeing a lot of that, right? We're seeing some in the United States. We're definitely seeing it along the U.S. Mexico southern border. You're seeing lots of, of companies moving to Mexico or setting up or expanding you know, facilities there. You know, the industrial parks are full and there's lots of construction happening. So I think that is a good sign, frankly, that we're seeing um, more growth here. Um, I mean, we're seeing the U.S. economy with all of its struggles actually being pretty strong. You know, it, we've been predicting recession for I don't know how many quarters now, and we're still we're still not there. The labor market is strong, and, and and that sort of thing. So I think that is in part some of this that we're seeing kind of economic expansion, which lots of reasons, but but there's some movement back here. Um, I think another thing that I'm watching is is the federal government getting back into funding research and development. Um, and we've had seen, you know, there was kind of the palace Sundays, the big days of the 1960s and 70s, and you know, we're going to the moon and there was lots of money and, and over in recent years, there's still a lot of research and development money, a lot, especially in San Francisco, um, but the, the balance between private companies and, and the government had changed. And it's, 
it's really only the government that has sort of a long enough lead time that they can fund the most kind of quixotic paths that don't necessarily lead to the direction that you're going, right? And, and so, I mean, there's all the famous examples of, you know, GPS and, and other things that you know, weren't necessarily what they were looking for, but, but or touch screen technology, this stuff came out of other kinds of government funded programs. So I think the government, the US government as well as, as Europe, as well as China, are getting back in the game of funding basic research. And I think that is a good sign for wherever we head next, whether it's climate, you know, green transition and, and the like. So I think those are all good signs. Um, the worry, frankly, I have, there's a few worries I have about the US and I don't see us moving is, I don't see us getting into the trade game. Um, you know, over the last three, four years, lots of other countries have signed trade agreements. We're seeing a kind of rewriting of global trading structures, and we're not part of the game. And it means our goods are going to be much more expensive. Um, and so if, if the way out of this for US communities is to sell more all over the world, we're, we're putting ourselves at a disadvantage. And you know, I see China going ahead and they signed an agreement with 12 other you know, Asian countries that will make it easier for them to produce and sell in that region, make our goods more expensive there. They're trying to join CPTPP. They are out there making deals. Um, Europe is doing the same with lots of countries. And so I think there are reticence and sort of standing back means, it means that our goods produced here, our manufacturers, our services will suffer. They'll face a competitive disadvantage. And so I worry about that, that we, back to our political discussion, we can't seem to get our heads around that and it means that we're going to lose out and we're going to wake up and we already are in some industries and we're just not going to be competitive in markets because of tariffs, because of regulations and the like. So that worries me is that we still haven't gotten the urgency yet to, to go out there and, 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 and compete in these markets. Okay. Um, we've unfortunately got to the point in the program that I've uh, got time for one last question. Right. And then I want to encourage those of you who are uh, here with us in person that uh, Dr. Onya will be available to sign the books that you've purchased uh, right out, outside this. Okay. And uh, if you haven't had a chance online to purchase her book, again, we're talking about the globalization myth, why regions matter. Uh, it's uh, a good read and, and very uh, helpful way to understand what's going on in the world today. So I want to ask you a question that says, uh, if you're looking back 10 years from now, and the world is, is evolved in the direction that you would like it to be, in terms of regionalization and that kind of coordination, what, should we be, what will it look like? What, you know, how is it going to be different than today? What's the kind of you know, Dr. O'Neill view from 20, 33 that says, you know what, we really got this right. What's the, what are we going to see? So I think we'll see a much more vibrant U.S. economy. I think we'll see uh, growth um, and businesses and companies and technology not just be in a few core cities, um, not to put San Francisco down, but we'll, we'll see it spread out a little bit more. We'll see a little bit more inclusive growth in that sense. We will see many more ties to other countries. We'll get that exporting and importing, that the back and forth is the way to grow. And we will see products that are made across North America, perhaps including other countries in the Western Hemisphere or Europe, are really globally competitive, right? So, so electronics, um, Asian, you know, electronic supply chains, which produce, you know, the vast majority, there'll be, there'll be versions here um, that will also be able to compete around the world. So, you know, there might be an iPhone made in North America that's selling in India, right, versus just the other way around. So I think you'll see a much more diversified and, and higher, more sophisticated industries that have returned and, and come back to, to North America and the like. So I think that's, that's part of it. Um, you know, I would settle for um, the end of the Russian-Ukraine war and not a war in China and Taiwan. Like, I would take that as a win as well, 10 right. years from now, as, as we sort of tamp down on the great power competition that seems to be ratcheting itself up. But, but leaving aside the, you know, the hot, hot wars, um, the, the U.S. and China have also found a way to kind of come to some sort of, of balance, let's say, um, and, and the, the sort of geopolitical ratcheting up that we're seeing that I think will make it hard to get back to the nuts and bolts of just how do we grow our economies and how do we do it in inclusive ways that are more beneficial to everybody. Um, we, we put some of that stuff aside and we focus in on that. And that, whether that's for people in the United States or for people in China and other places, how do you make more inclusive growth? Um, and that's what I would hope to see. Fantastic. Well, very much look forward to that 
coming, having you come back here 10 years from now and saying, you predicted this is what we're going to see. Let's so, hope. <laughs> but uh, again, our thanks to Shannon O'Neill, the Nelson and David Rockefeller Senior Fellow for Latin American Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations and author of this new book, The Globalization Myth, Why Regions Matter. Uh, thank you for spending the evening with us. We'd also like to thank our audience here in person and for those who are watching us on YouTube and other media. And if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making virtual programming, please uh, visit commonwealthclub.org slash online. And thank you again for joining us this evening. And Shannon, it's great to see you again. Thank you all. It's been great. Thank you.